Hey guys, welcome back. So we are getting started with five parsecs from home. I'm still just as excited as I was when I uh, did the video. So I figured I'd just stick with it and run this through uh, without kind of letting up. Now what I have done since we last uh, since we last looked at five parsecs from home is I have assembled my initial crew. I've went through the uh, crew creation. Uh, and I'm only thing I have left to do at this point is set up my first game or start my campaign. So I figured this was a good place to pause and kind of show you guys uh, what I've done. I will say this, doing this crew sheet here was very, very, very fun. I just sat here at a night. I watched uh, some stuff on TV, I think some YouTube channels. Uh, and I just started going through picking characters and I kind of followed the whole procedure that is laid out in the book And it was really fun. It was really interesting and, uh, It took a little while but the time just seemed to fly and everything seemed to make sense and even when I was rolling some of the uh, Some of the random results it was so uh, It was so funny how some of the results coincided with my actual uh, background that I had already typed out or created which you guys would have heard at the end of my five parsecs from home uh, review so uh, it was just cool and I'm going to show you that there were a few things which I controlled and when I say control is instead of rolling I went through the tables that were provided uh, by the author and I picked the one that was most appropriate for my character that I was going to be using because I already had an ideal of his background of kind of why he's out here so i decided to control a few of his roles his companions uh i pretty much wrote their 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 uh information up as it stated in the ruse uh but there were a few things i controlled with them as well and that is what i love about the game i didn't have to change anything i just kind of looked at what he had made available and said well this one is closer to what uh they should be so I think the first thing I'm going to do in this video before we get into the character sheet and the character creation and things, because that might take a while and uh, I may do that as a separate video where I go through that with you guys, how I, how I put them together, who they are and everything like that. I just wanted to show you I had done that. But what I'm going to do in this very first video is I'm going to look at... Uh, the things I am going to be using to play five parsecs from home and you know where I think they will fit in and how I think I'm going to use them I was going to do this like I said when Stargrave came out I was really excited to kind of start looking through miniatures and things like that uh, I've kind of decided that Stargrave right now is not is not a system I want to use so I'm going to do that now for five parsecs from home uh, because it's just as miniature as Gnostic, it's just as open world. And uh, I'm going to uh, just kind of show you some of the things you can use or you can proxy in. Because this this obviously is a game you use whatever you have. So let's get started with that. Okay, so the first thing obviously that you're going to want to do to play five parsecs from home or any system uh, where you can use your own miniatures is find miniatures. Uh, there are a lot of manufacturers that do sci-fi miniatures that are somewhat generic. Uh, I know North Star does some for their uh, Rogue Stars line. Obviously, the ones I think most people are looking forward to are going to be the uh, North Star ones for Stargrave, which I would highly recommend getting a box because from what they seem, you can just make whatever you need. So that's that's going to give you a lot of options that you simply can't get through picking through miniatures from other lines and proxying them. But I don't think you'd want to spend your entire money doing that, building every miniature in the game from scratch. And uh, I don't even really think it's necessary because as you play the missions from what I've seen, uh, there will be certain numbers of the enemy forces, the AI forces that are going to all be identical and all be armed identically. So that's basically just bulk troops that you that you can use almost any line of miniatures for. I mean, you don't want to spend 
on say a, a box that has 30 miniatures and 15 of them are just going to be built into the exact same troops with the exact same weapons if you understand what i'm saying whereas if you take that box of 30 and use it just for your characters you can build 30 unique characters so for me the main line by far that i'm going to be using for a lot of reasons is going to be an old line called uh star wars miniatures now star wars miniatures was the predecessor although it didn't know it was the predecessor because it didn't exist at the time but it was the predecessor to star star wars legion meaning this was a miniature version miniature game with rules and information on uh on you know star wars so just and, and it was a pretty pretty well well supported line i think at one point almost every miniature for star wars had a figure these were pre-painted, so they were more like your D&D &D pre painted miniatures. And there was two versions. So there was a miniature version, which was the miniatures. And, you know, it showed you how to play the game, which was actually quite simple. And, I mean, if you wanted to use these rules for the combat in a game like Five Parsecs from Home, you could mostly do that. You'd have a problem with your gear and your weapons, a lot of which is very germane to the rules. So, but... uh the other one was the Starships, the Star Wars Miniature Starship Battles. And this one I I am actually considering bringing back and playing some of my initial games of Star, I mean of uh, Five Parsecs from Home using these, these rules for my characters and their ships. Because remember I said I was looking for a system I could do some ship battles with. And... You know, they have miniatures of almost all of these different types of cool looking ships from the Star Wars universe and, you know, the stats and how they would how they could fight against one another. So I haven't I haven't made up my mind totally because I am leaning toward writing my own set of rules for uh, doing the starship combat, just something quick and kind of thematic to the way I wanted to play. But I am going to take a look at these and see if it's, you know, if it's something that I could implement quickly for some battles. Uh, but to get back to where we're at with five parsecs from home, I'm going to be using these miniatures in one form or another to basically populate my game world. And so that's what we're going to look at today is some of the miniatures that are available and uh, you know, maybe give you my thoughts on where how some of them are going to fit in. Okay, so the first miniatures I'm going to want to incorporate are going to be my uh, obviously your stormtroopers, and the stormtroopers can represent just your basic grunts. Whether you use them as unity figures, you can use them as unity security, you can use them as uni unity agents, unity special forces, whatever. Or you can use them alternatively, like I'm thinking of maybe a corporate force on a fringe world, maybe a, a very developed fringe world. Uh, you could also use them, as I am considering, as an alternate or competing empire. And so I am thinking of writing in a narrative where there is kind of a breakaway wing from Unity uh, that is basically working in the galaxy to supplant Unity as the ruling power that maybe this this uh force has combined its forces and its troops on several fringe worlds or maybe even some core worlds and uh you know they are as big a threat i have not actually seen that in the fluff or the narrative uh that you get uh in five parsecs from home but let's just say there is there is a lot of room in there for something like that using the fluff or the narrative Especially when you learn that, you know, unity is more or less tolerated than actually uh, appreciated. But let's take a look at the miniatures. Okay, so first up, we've got these uh, stormtroopers. And one of the things I noticed about the stormtroopers when I started to go through them was that uh, they are not all armed with the same weapon, although it might initially appear that way. So if we look at this this trooper here, he has a weapon that is almost just barely above a pistol, but it's not a pistol, right? Whereas if we look at this guy here, 
His weapon is almost like a short barrel rifle, as you can see. And then this one here almost has a variant of the pistol, but he definitely has some type of scope or targeting uh, device on there. And so you can use these in a couple of ways. One, you could say, well, they're all the same weapons, but they're modified. So this guy would have some type of scope, obviously, or targeting reticle modification. Whereas this guy might have your uh, might have your uh, stronger power one, maybe with a battery or something. And this guy might have your basic version. Or you could obviously simply say they're all three different weapons. Now there are there are some uh, Star Wars miniatures in this series that have unique weapons, which are totally unique. And so we're going to move them into the picture. And we're going to take a look at that. So we have this guy here that definitely has more of a, a long rifle. He even has a different visor, if you can kind of pick that out. Uh, we have this one here. Who's, now, this is an actual pistol. You know, and he's actually issuing some kind of command. And then we have this guy here who obviously has some type of heavy weapon or bazooka or something. And there are rules for area effect weapons in uh, five parsecs from home. So again, that, that can be that can be a different weapon that can fill a role in the game. Uh, let's see what other versions we have here. We have this guy here who has more of a rifle with the sight on it. This guy here has a weapon we've seen before, but he's obviously in a different type of uniform. And then we have this guy here, which you can't see. <laughs> Okay, so we will get these three out of the way. So like I said, this guy here has literally a rifle with a sight. Doesn't quite look like a sniper rifle. It maybe looks a little too short, but uh, definitely a different type of weapon, not even a modification. This guy here obviously is in some different gear, maybe more clandestine. The weapon looks similar to one of the ones we've seen before. But, uh, you know, maybe this would be more of a guy wearing a stealth suit or stealth camouflage for the Unity. And then this guy here definitely has a very long rifle. You know, this could be either a, a sniper or a high power type of rifle. Uh, or you could use it for some other type of, uh, you know, any, any air or any tank type of weapon. And so if we put all of these together, just dealing with your basic uh, stormtroopers, you know, you can really get a lot of use out of these on the field because you could either go with the regular rules and say, well, these guys are all using the same weapon, or you can distinguish and pick each of them out. And the rules do that. So the rules will tell you in each scenario how many are specialists and you need to roll for their weapons or their gear separately. So I really like being able to do that with this collection. Okay, so now we have some more unique type of guys. Still a few stormtroopers in here. So this guy has a weapon and a pack. You know, almost gives you an idea of a flamethrower. Or maybe something that needs a big pack or heavy generator. So this would definitely be categorized as a heavy. And again, the rules are very simple that you could easily create your own stats within the game rules to represent these weapons using the whole keyword system. You give it a number of dice. You decide if there's going to be a modifier to the damage, the number of shots, and then you decide what keywords would apply. So, I mean, I could literally create a profile for this weapon. We have this guy here. Again, this kind of looks like a weapon we haven't seen before, although it would probably be like a standard infantry laser. We have this guy here who's basically wielding two pistols, but he definitely has on different armor. So where they all have on combat armor, he may this may just be a flak vest, which there's rules for that. And then finally, I wanted to show you these two guys who you could use as infinity field agents. Now, they are not human, but they are humanoid enough that they could be part of the unity and some of the unity field agents. 
Because this is the ideal I get from the ruse reading about field agents, right? They're going to be they're going to be operating far out in the fringe, protecting the interests of unity with the ability to call in teams of stormtroopers when needed. Now, here is a faction I'm sure you've all heard of but may not recognize from their armor in this version of the game. These are Mandalorians, believe it or not. So all of these are considered Mandalorians. And in a game like Five Parsecs from Home, again, you could use these as different types of uh, unity operatives or... You could maybe put them together as their own fringe world faction. Maybe some type of uh, pirates from one of the planets. You know, maybe mercenaries or bounty hunters, right? Which Mandalorians are bounty hunters. So these guys could represent bounty hunters in your game. A bounty hunters league or something or coalition that operates on the fringe worlds. Uh, so, I mean, it's very easy to... Uh, Put some rules together and incorporate them and bring them into play. And because their helmets are masked, I mean, they you could even, you know, use them as a as an alien faction. You know, their, their helmets are on. These could be converted underneath there. Uh, with the armor, you could even try to say that they're maybe one of the androids, like the Solus uh, or the bots or something like that. So uh, you can get a lot of use out of these types of miniatures. Now, one of the primary alien races that they mention in the game is the Kirin. And my my impression of the Kirin are kind of like your Kleons, or uh, maybe even a combination of Kleons and Romulans. And so, for that type of faction, but they are humanoid. You know, you could use miniatures like these, obviously assuming you don't have any just straight up uh, Kleon miniatures to use. And the thing about it, even though we don't get much information on the uh, on the type of uh, diverse units and uh, uh, races on uh, in that species of Kirin, you understand that they are a they are a species. So there are going to be different different races or whatever among them, or different factions or classes among them. So you might have this guy might just be a a, a Kiran assassin or operative this guy might be some type of kirin ambassador and this guy you know might be a kirin hand-to-hand -hand combat warrior or something so you got to think of it like that don't simply think that because they're kirin they should all just you know all just have uh you know uh combat daggers or something and you know be be uh hand-to-hand -hand specialists because even within a society where hand-to-hand -hand combat or combat in general is uh is glorified there still will be people who will do other things who will kind of shy away from that and just accept that hey okay i'm not going to be one of the great warriors of people in this society now of course this is what i love about the whole star wars universe is kind of the everyday day-to-day -day people that you see depicted so here we have what would be normally rebels, but in your game, I mean, this guy is obviously some type of pilot, so he could either be a pilot you hire, or he could be your character in your in your pilot outfit. This guy could be used as an engineer or a person that is on your crew repairing things. These guys could either be security. You could use them as everything from ship security. Maybe you have three or four characters that you built that are your security guys for your ship. Or you could use them as planet security. Again, you have a character like this <clears throat> who is armed. So maybe this could be your character landing on a planet as plane. I mean, not as plane, but a spaceship crashes. So by far, you are going to want to get as many miniatures as you can in this, this style. Right, and this guy could I now see I would not use him as much as a unity type of agent as maybe a governor or a leader on one of the planets within, you know, either the unity's jurisdiction or the fringe. Because a lot of these planets work very closely with with unity. Like they, they rule at their at shall we say at their discretion. Uh so 
in one sense, they're not going to be all that different than dealing with unity itself. And so we have some other options here. And I mean, I love this range. These miniatures, you know, they vary in price. And I'm sure they're going to go up as, uh, as people are looking for proxies for uh, games like Stargrave and Five Parsecs from Home. But, uh, you know, start looking for them now. As, the, as many as you can get, you know, get your hands on them. I, I probably have more than enough of these types from this collection, but, uh, you know, I, I'm even going to see if I can locate some more. So that gives us, that gives us, uh, kind of our humans, you know, in this world. Okay. And so the last thing I'm going to take a look at, uh, with these Star Wars miniatures is kind of what I would say is everything else. And this kind of represents all of the other generic, uh, creatures or species or aliens or life forms that may come into the game, a lot of which are going to come into the game through the game rules and through your campaign system. Uh, in particular, this is probably going to be the hardest types of miniatures to fill out in your collection are bots and robots because they do play a big role in this game. So uh, if you have any kind of miniatures like this, you know, you want to kind of put them aside so you know where you can get to them when you're going to need them in the game. Uh, I started to use this with my starting crew, but this looks like more of an advanced type of robot. So I didn't want to bring him in at the very beginning with almost no stats or ability. So I decided to go with something a little more basic. But, I mean, you have guys like this that might be a leader on a planet. You know, you have guys like this that might be somebody you have to trade or do business with on a planet. You have guys like this that could be an agent or somebody on a foreign planet. You know, obviously we have our Wookiees that could be warriors or warriors for hire. And then you just kind of have just straight up creatures. You know, they really have no specific, uh, no specific role other than they're creatures. And then, of course, I like these guys, you know. Uh, I forgot what they were called in Star Wars. Let's see if it's on here. Is it Ewok? Jawa. So you have Jawa. And that's funny. I think that even says Fringe on there. Fringe. <laughs> yep. So yeah, this guy would be perfect out in the Fringe. Land on a planet like his. You can even make him part of your crew. Right, you know, a life form, you know, especially under Unity, you know, basically in Unity, you're likely to encounter any type of life form that basically humans have come in contact with. Okay, now, in case you thought that uh, Five Parsecs was Home was only for playing out Firefly games or Firefly like games, that's not true. So all of these guys are wielding blades, and Five Parsecs from Home has a separate rule for how hand-to-hand -hand combats are carried out, uh, including weapons that take part in hand-to-hand -hand combats or melees or brawls. And there is actually a specific weapon called a glare sword, right, as in a light saber glare sword. And the glare sword is defined as an elegant fencing weapon. The blade is encased in a disruptive energy field, allowing it to cut with great precision. Right? And that's, there's other, other things in here where you have blades, which are kind of more like your, your 40K kind of chainsaw blades. Uh, like a boarding saber, which I don't know. The boarding saber might be a little different. It says a heavily but carefully balanced sword often fitted with hand guards. Then you have a blade and so forth. But in this instance, I think the closest one would be uh, the glare sword. Now, if you do want a, a marine with a chainsaw sword, you would get the ripper sword. And the ripper sword is a short chopping blade fitted with microscopic teeth for ripping and tearing, popular with Kirin marines. So that's basically your chain sword. Now, the glare sword, from what I can see, let's see, it is a broad weapon. It adds nothing to damage 
Nothing to, obviously, no shots. It is mealy, elegant, and piercing. So, elegant means you can re-roll your die. Uh, melee just means you get plus two to brawling rolls. Wow. And piercing is... Let's see. It's probably going to do more damage, even though it's not in the actual stats. Uh, ignore armor saving throws. So you're going to cut right through any type of uh, creatures that have armor. A la last episode of The Mandalorian. Okay. Okay, and so I think the last thing I'm going to look at with regards to the Star Wars miniatures, at least for today, because these are going to be reappearing in my games and reappearing in some of my videos. But the last thing I'm going to look at is ships. Now, obviously, in the game, you don't need a ship model because your ship is really kind of confined to your post-game operations and actions. But first of all, I think it's more fun to use a ship model. So whatever you decide your character is going to start with, if you buy it, if you upgrade it, you know, it's nice to have a ship to represent that. Maybe you want to play some opening scenes of your ship coming in for landing. And if, like me, you plan on actually trying to create some ship battles, then obviously you want to have a lot of different types of ships. We don't get any indication in the rules as to what type of ships the... Uh, the unity would use, although we can assume they're going to be advanced, powerful, and uh, a lot of varied type of ships. You know, then you have the Kieran ships and uh, stuff. So you can either lead that to your own mind or impression, or you can kind of find models and kind of make up your own mind about what they would use. So for my example, like if I was to pick this ship, I would probably say this would be a ship that would be more used by the Solus, maybe even the Converted, some type of, some of your uh, more robotic uh, type of species or android species. I would say this would be more of a ship used by the Precursors, who I said remind me kind of your space elves with kind of more advanced technology. Uh... This ship here might be something that would be used by the Kirin, whatever, which is kind of Cleon, Romulan, and that style. And this ship here would be something that would be used maybe by uh, fringe people, maybe a common ship, maybe an ex-Unity ship that is used by the fringe and some of those different types of worlds to get around. Now, if you're saying, well, Dino, what would be your Unity ship? I'm going to show you guys that in a second. Okay, so again, here are some more examples of what I think would be fringe types of ships. So this I would see more as a fringe type of fighter ship. Maybe if you have a solo character or special character, I would see them in this type of ship. This obviously would be more of a fringe type of multi-purpose craft of some sort. You know, you could use that as kind of anything. Again, these are some more of your friendships. And the reason I say all of these I would use as your fringe is because they're very, very, they're very diverse, but they're also common enough that, yeah, people are going to take the same model or ship, but they're going to do different things with it. And that's what kind of makes it cool and it gives you that feel. Like if you know the fluff behind Firefly, Firefly is actually the class of ship, which is the Serenity. So the ship is called Serenity. The style of ship is called Firefly, right? And Firefly is actually kind of an outdated, uh, an outdated ship in that, in that era, you know, kind of an older, outdated uh, scavenger type of ship in that era. So that is what you want to do if you are going to be playing these games in the Fringe, you want models, right, that if you are going to depict their ships in your games, kind of have varied uh, varied styles and varied images, but they're kind of all common, very common frames. Now, if you're going to depict Unity ships, you've got to go with the uh, Star Trek aesthetic. 
I mean, that whole aesthetic of Unity screams out Star Trek. So you are looking at more of your advanced ships. Any any organization that could basically control the known galaxy and exer, uh, exercise its jurisdiction throughout the galaxy on many different worlds against many different species is obviously going to have very advanced fleets, very advanced military hardware. So you're either going to want to go with something like this, meaning these types of Star Trek feel, or you're going to want to go with something like a Halo feel, right? So you have these uh, these Halo ships that are going to just appear over planets and so forth. So I don't have any Halo ships. So for me, I think the perfect proxy is going to be a range of these Star Trek ships. And the way I look at it is Unity is more like you are playing games in the alternate Star Trek universe. So if you ever saw the episodes of Star Trek, I think it was Mirror Mirror or something like that, where they have the alternate Kirk and the alternate Spock, that same world is kind of what a Unity government or infrastructure would be, right? So it's not purely tyrannical, but it suffers very little uh it suffers very little uh resistance or objection to its rule right and so that is kind of the the ideal you want to go for even though you're going to still kind of see the same types of ships and the same type of technology and so along those lines if you are playing a force like the Kirin and this is a force that is kind of a threat to uh, the Unity, then obviously the Kirin is going to need similar ships and similar vessels. So this, again, would be more of your... This would be more of your Kirin government types of ships. Your Kirin military types of ships would either be the Cleons, the Romulans, or a combination thereof. Now, the ship I showed you earlier, and I said, well, this would be a good Kieran ship. This would represent Kieran's on fringe worlds, right? Or Kieran's within the core worlds that are traveling on their own. So while a, a Kieran privateer or Kieran bounty hunter or a Kieran merchant might have a vessel like this, if you're dealing with the Kieran government, you're going to have vessels like these. And again, for 99% of your games in uh, five parsecs from home, it won't really matter, right? You won't really need to use these because there's not going to be any practical sense where they're going to be maneuvering or need to be depicted. But in order to get that feel or that game world, you know, you may want to depict them on your table in some form. And again, if you decide to set up some type of separate space battles, then yeah, you're going to you're going to want to, to be able to uh, produce this aesthetic. Okay, so having shown you guys the my ideals of the unity a uh, uh, unity fleet, you know, I thought it was only uh, logical to show you the uh, miniatures I'm going to use to populate that fleet. So these are going to be more or less your unity military slash security forces. And I've got two ideals with this. So this is the crew from Star Trek, the next generation. And obviously this is Picard. And so my ideal is this guy is going to probably more or less be a recurring character in my game who represents the unity and represents this fleet. Whether, I, whether it's the military or security version of it. And obviously, this will be his crew. So in some games, it might be just him. In other games, it may just be a member of his crew. And then in other games, it may be, you know, the entire group of them, depending on what is going on in the mission. And my ideal for the Picard-type character is going to be a very strict, by-the-book ambitious unity officer meaning well let me put this a very strict very by the book respected com a unity officer meaning this guy is going to follow every procedure every code laid down by unity 
And so when he appears with my characters, he will be fair, but he will be tough. And so that may have an effect on their missions or their campaign or whatever. And that's going to affect how they feel or how they react when him and his crew comes along. He's the type of guy that if you're in danger, you're glad to see he's there. But when the fight is all over with, you probably know you're going to have to answer for a lot of things uh, that you were kind of doing underneath or off the grid. And that's going to more or less reflect him and his entire crew. On the other hand, if you happen to run into this unity commander and his crew, you know, this is going to be kind of your a la Captain Kirk TOS original series type of crew. And as I said, we're playing the alternate version of these characters as we see them. So he is going to be known as a very kind of off the books, a very kind of uh, underhanded, a very kind of side deal cutting type of unity guy. He's the type of guy that you can pay off or bargain with your way to get out of a situation, right? He may even take out an enemy for you, but you are going to owe him in return. And that is what him and his crew is going to represent to the very fact that at any given time, members of his own crew may be conspiring against him and telling you, you know, hey, this is what you're going to deal with unless you deal with me. I'm going to go tell, you know, the Kirk man what's going on. So this is the type of unity crew you don't necessarily want to see if you are vulnerable because they just may knock you and your crew off and take everything you got and it never shows up in the reports. But he is type the type of one you are going to go look to to go sit down with when you need something done that only unity and a unity vessel or, or crew can take care of. So I really like that. I, I mean, I'm not sure how I'm going to work it all in yet, how successful it's going to be. But uh, I definitely think there's room in the ruse to kind of pull this off. And then the last ones we've got are just some, uh, these are some generic ones from the reboot, if you remember that. So these guys are just going to be kind of typical Unity guys that you're likely to run into at any given place or situation. So if I'm playing a game where, they, where your crew visits a Unity facility, you're going to more or less see characters like these, these figures, rather than kind of the name crew or name characters who, you know, they're not going to be manning just some basic unity, uh, you know, some basic unity uh, outpost or star base or something like that. They, they, they actually have a lot more freedom and latitude, and when they show up, it's going to be for a reason. But this allows me to extend that aesthetic and stay faithful to it in just kind of one-off types of games or situations. But that's kind of what we're looking at right now, guys. We're getting started. And like I said, the next video, I'm going to show you my crew I put together. I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit of what I did and why I did it uh, with that. And then uh, I may do one more video where I look at just kind of my other miniatures uh, from some of my other games. Like I have some uh, some Halo Hero Clicks figures that I'm thinking of bringing into the game and incorporating them. I have some Dead Zone, some Alien vs. Predator, and a lot of that. I mean, obviously, I can't show everything in these videos before I get started, but uh, what I may do is, at the beginning of some of the videos, just kind of show you the miniatures that are going to be featured in there. And I still got a lot more of the uh, Star Wars miniatures. There's some very unique miniatures that came out of that line. Take care. God bless. Hey, Dad, it's Jake. I don't know if you can hear this, but just in case, I'm almost ready to head out. Bethesda did a full burn with no problem. After all these years, she really is a good ship. My friend Mace that I completed cadet school with before Mom died is coming with me. Even his sister Trish said she would come along. I know you never cared much for Mace. 
his father being wealthy and all and refusing to sponsor that job you did with Ma on Zition 6. Or was it Rash or 4? I'm sorry, I forget. Anyway, Mace was the only one I knew who could get me the sector permits I needed to operate on the core worlds. When I asked what he wanted in return, he said he just wanted to travel. To be a nomad, as he put it. Trish, she just wanted to find stuff. Anyway, one of the oxidizers on Bethesda is acting up, but the Rombot said there was a 64.7% chance of it holding until we got to a core space. Did I mention I got that Rombot A1 working that you got mom for her last birthday? Yeah, turns out it was just a loose fusion nozzle. Mom sure would have loved having a working Rombot. You know, she never blamed you for pledging the quad to get it. She just couldn't bear to look in your face when it didn't work. Well, like I said, I'm almost ready to leave, Dad. See you soon. Jake.